thank you everybody for attending tonight on this smoky Thursday. Um, I, we have a fantastic panel. I just wanna introduce each one of them real quick and then dive right into the questions. And we're gonna, the format is basically 45 minutes of discussion. And then we have the last 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if questions go over, I'm sure our panelists would mind staying a few extra minutes, but we don't like to go much past eight o'clock. Um, so let's start with Lisa, Lisa Burby, uh, who has been an adjunct professor at Adelphi's communication department in Garden City since 2003. She teaches newspaper and magazine feature writing classes and magazine editing and production classes for which students produce a published magazine. In 2012, she was promoted to senior adjunct professor and she is the faculty advisor to the school newspaper, The Delphian. She's also been a freelance writer and editor for more than 30 years and writes for Newsday, national magazines and websites and has written 40 books. That's a lot of books. Uh, Zachary Dowdy is an assistant professor of practice at Stony Brook University. Uh, he has been there since 2003. He has also worked for the Boston Herald and the Boston Globe. Most recently, he was a rewrite and criminal justice reporter and United Nations correspondent for Newsday at Stony Brook. He is co-coordinator of the Robert W. Green Summer Institute for High School Journalists, a week-long residential journalism program boot camp for students, which is very popular here on Long Island. Uh, and then we have Holly Hare, who is chair of the Mass Communications Department at Five Towns College, where she has helped create multiple broadcast reporting and journalism classes. She started as an adjunct at Five Towns Community College and St. John's University in 2006. At the time, she was still a freelance reporter and anchor at 1010 Winds. She became a faculty member at Five Towns shortly after and still occasionally freelances for Winds. Okay, uh, so why don't we get started with uh, questions? And uh, why don't we start with Zach? Uh, Zachary, tell us a little bit about when and how you decided to become a college professor. What was kind of the spark, the inspiration? Because I'm sure a number of folks in our audience might be thinking, is this right for me? So what did it for you? Well, you know, I think I've always wanted to be a college professor, you know, even when I was an undergraduate. So in some respects, I was going to go way, way back. But as someone who although my career path took a different turn than what I had intended when I was an undergraduate. I was interested in medicine, went to a high school that was, you know, primarily interested, in, primarily concerned about sciences and et cetera. And, um, but when I got into college, I began to be more interested in, um, in facts and politics and history and et cetera. And so the science was something that I retained, but I don't, I don't do any of it. So that having been said, um, while I was in college, I was fascinated with uh, professors and, and the whole uh, the university climate. And so I knew at some point I certainly would like to teach. That said, after having a career as a journalist for some time, it was actually relatively early in my career when I was working for the um, Boston Globe um, that um, I was working with a high school program like the one that I uh, work for now uh, in, at Stony Brook, where um, one of the professors who was at the university, then it's the University of Massachusetts at Boston, asked me, she said, said, she said that I, I, she thought I had a good way with, with students and whether or not I'd like to, to try teaching. And they were starting a new program, which is in a school of professional studies, I think it was called. And it was a kind of a writing program. It was a whole bunch of types of writing, really a superficial course for adult learners. And I, I tried my hand at it. So that was the beginning of my actually um, uh, becoming a, a professor of some sort. So I really liked it. I liked interacting with students. Uh, and I said that that's pretty early in, in, in my career, maybe about five or six years out of, uh, of, of uh, college. So um, because I had such a good experience there, I knew that I would at some point want to do it uh, full time. So I had a you know pretty substantial career um, with uh, with Newsday as well as with with the Boston Globe, where I uh, have done all types of things, and as all of that was information and material that I was gathering, so that I could pass that on to students. And so uh, an opportunity came up uh, in 2003 or so uh, at Stony Brook, which was you know for a full time position. Once I left the Globe, I was no longer teaching. I was just sort of just doing uh, at Newsday. And I came to Newsday in 99, actually, so uh, quite some time ago. Uh, but while there in 2003 or four, 2003, I think it was, um, 
I was actually covering, beginning to cover the United Nations at that point um, for Newsday. This is obviously the start of the, you know, war on terror, you know, the Iraq invasion, those kinds of things. And so um, uh, I actually, actually set, started two new gigs at the same time. One was starting as an adjunct at Stony Brook and then also starting as the UN correspondent um, for Newsday. So it was kind of a, a long commute going two places at the same time. So, you know, from, from Stony Brook to the United Nations was, was kind of tricky. Um, so it was, it was nice that it was, I started off somewhat slowly with just a, one course and basically two days out of the week. Uh, so I was able to handle it. And that's kind of how things happen as a sort of a work creep. You start off with this one course, maybe, you know, or co-teaching a course and it kind of like builds and builds and builds. So since then I've been at, at Stony Brook and I made the switch to a full-time um, uh, professor in 2000, September of 2000, 2020. So that's where I've been since then. That seems to be a, a, the pattern, the, 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 the path. Uh, mm -hmm. Lisa, how about you? What inspired you uh, to get into teaching, uh, particularly given all the writing that you do? So I think for me, it was a happy accident because okay. it, it was writing for Newsday. Um, I was at the time the parenting writer on Long Island. Um, and on the side for fun, I was teaching adult ed classes at Northport High School and in the lib and various libraries um, because I had also been writing nonfiction books for kids. So I was doing like a how to be a children's book writer kind of um, classes. And, and I found I really enjoyed being in front of, at that point, adults and, um, and, and seeing how inspired they could be when somebody was paying attention to what their dreams were. Um, and then around um, 2003, I was at that point for five years already, um, the editor in chief of Newsday's Parents and Children magazine. And I was doing some alumni work with um, St. John's University where I had gotten my Bachelor of Science degree. So Peggy Cassidy, um, who was the department chair at Adelphi, was also an alum and, of St. John's. And she was looking for someone specifically to teach their magazine journalism class. So I think she connected with St. John's. I'm not 100% sure it was so long ago. But um, we connected and she asked me to come in and teach a magazine class. And I've been teaching that magazine feature class now for a very long time. Um, but I, in addition, then they asked me if I could teach newspaper feature writing. And then I said, well, you know, I at that point, I owned my own magazine company. I owned Long Island Parent Magazine. And I said, what if I taught a magazine editing and production class so that students could actually learn how to, from start to finish, the pain that I was going through, <laughs> um, you know, developing an idea, um, look at developing a theme and, and going all from uh, developing story ideas all the way to production through production. And, um, and so those are some of the things I introduced. And then um, about 10, 12 years ago, they asked me if I would be the faculty advisor for the Delphian. And so I've been doing that ever since. So. I never intended to be a professor, but I love every minute of it. And I'm sure later on we'll talk about, you know, the benefits to our careers as well as what we do for the students. So, very nice. Okay. Yeah. Holly, I have to let my you? dog in. I'm sorry. Don't worry. No worries. No worries. Uh, and Holly, how about you? What inspired you? So I also kind of I don't want to say fell into it. It was sort of an interest that I had. Uh, I was working uh, with with interns every now and then, and thought that was kind of neat. And I was at News 12 and I did a story at Nassau Community College. This is this was maybe 2005 or something like that. And I asked the, um, I was interviewing the president and I was asking him after we were done, like how would one become an adjunct here? And he said, you have to have a doctorate. And I said, okay, thanks. <laughs> See you later. Cause I didn't have a doctorate. I had a bachelor's and I, I had and have no plans to get a doctorate. So I was like, well, that's that. But then over time I was still talking with a couple of people that I was, interested in doing something like this. And one of my coworkers slash bosses at Fios News went to St. John's and was on the faculty there. And we were just sort of keeping in touch, like, hey, I'm interested if anything opens up. And in the meantime, one of my coworkers at 1010 Winds was an adjunct at Five Towns. So we would chat about it and a couple of years passed and, oh, that sounds interesting. And he would come and he'd have papers to grades, so he'd grade his papers and then he'd get to work. So we were just chatting about it over time. And then the winter, like January, 2016, both five towns 
and St. John's ended up having a last minute shift in personnel and both of them ended up having a class open up at the same time. So I ended up starting both at both places as an adjunct. And I really found it interesting. Um, shortly after that, I was mostly, I was mostly working at WINS three days a week and occasionally at News 12 at that point. And then WINS started to dry up, they were being sold. Some of the regular shifts that I had were eliminated. And one of the, there was a, an administration change at Five Towns. And at the time when I started at Five Towns, they had a radio station, they didn't have a TV studio. Um, the administration changed and said, hey, if we're gonna be teaching broadcasting and mass communication, we really need to have a TV studio. We have a very strong film department. We have some of the equipment already. We need more equipment. But at the time they brought, they brought someone in who'd been there previously to build a TV studio from scratch. And as my Wednesdays were sort of waning, they said, hey, we could use you more here. So I was really lucky to have the days at Five Towns increase. And then I ended up being um, a faculty member there and not doing anything else, uh, occasional freelancing elsewhere. But about a couple of years later, then I became Five Towns um, an instructor. And then about two years ago, the chair who was my boss, he was promoted to a different job and they needed a chair. So now I'm the chair. So I were very small. So the things like that happened kind of quickly. Um, in the meantime, I also did, I did go back to school online and get a master's. So I forgot to say one of the things at St. John's was they really want you to have a master's. But since I knew somebody from Fios, he vouched for me and was able to get me in with the bachelor's, but it's definitely helpful to have a master's. Um, five towns, if you have a bachelor's and, and plenty of experience, which, which, which is what I initially thought when I was at, talking to the guy at Nassau Community College, I was like, I have a bachelor's, but I have a lot of experience. And he's like, no, no, thanks. Um, but at five towns, we're so small, we're, you know, we're often looking for people and, and you don't have to have a master's, but you, you know, would have maybe a bachelor's plus some experience. Well, that actually uh, leads to the next question, which is, and so why don't you start us off with this question in terms of what are the qualities, so probably have a lot of folks in the audience who are, have at least a, an interest in potentially teaching or um, have maybe even started teaching at one point. What are the specific qualifications that you need to become a professor of journalism? Um, and that it, I know depends on the college, but you know maybe you could talk a little bit about the specific qualifications. You mentioned you went back to school online to get a master's degree. Um, yeah, so talk a little bit about qualifications. What makes what makes you able to become a college professor? Well, again, for us, it's really someone who has done the job and is just good at explaining things to people and patients. And you do have to be organized in a different way when you're doing, at least I did, in, when I'm teaching college versus doing like a day of air story. When I start at nine o'clock, I do all my work in a rush and I'm done at five. And then the next day I do something else all day, done at five. There's a lot more planning for the college experience, but just someone who can plan and we do train, you know, we do train, we help our professors, our new ones, especially with planning because many of, you know, many of us, I'm sure many of our, our people who are in the Zoom right now have maybe talked to a class here and there and say, hey, that's kind of interesting. I, I'd like to maybe be a professor more than just once. So it's, it's fun to talk to the class once. And if you feel like you like something like that and you can hold their attention, now you've just sort of, you have to make that 15 weeks and you have to say, okay, what's my plan for all these weeks? So it's just sort of organizational skills, interest. Um, and, you know, and for us, if you're, you know, if you're interested in and want to do something like that, we'll, we'll work with you. Um, the hours can be hard though, because a lot of our classes are during the day. I know some other schools have more evening classes, which might lend, lend itself well to depending on when your day hours are. But there's not really a specific, I would say, qualification for us other than interest and some sort of degree. And experience, it sounds like. Uh, Lisa, how about you? Uh, what about Adelphi? What, uh, what qualifies one to become a, an Adelphi journalism professor? Well, so the uh, are you on mute? Is that it? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you, you're good now. So I've been very fortunate because I do not have a master's and I've been turned down by my alma mater because of that. Um, and I've not been able to teach anywhere else on Long Island, but Adelphi, again, they came to me and I've had conversations with them about the fact that I didn't have a master's. 
team that they value the 30 plus years of experience that I bring to my classrooms. And I'm very grateful for that. I agree with them. <laughs> I agree that students benefit when they hear from somebody, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, who's actually going out and working on a deadline every day. Um, and so I really appreciate that my department chairs have always valued that I'm bringing um, hands-on experience to my classroom, but I cannot teach anywhere else on Long Island. And I have debated whether I should get a master's just because of that. And to date, I have not leaped <laughs> to do so. Um, I don't know, maybe someday, but right now it's working for me. And I don't think with, given my schedule, I could possibly teach anywhere else. I think it would put me over the edge. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Zachary, uh, so Stony Brook is a research one university. Is that correct? I, I'm getting yes, that. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So there the qualifications are a little bit higher than many other places in terms of becoming a full-time assistant professor. And you have two forms of assistant professor there, um, professor of practice, which is you, and then you have assistant professor of research. So could you talk a little bit about those differences and what are the qualifications there and, and how that works at a research one university? And for those of you who don't know that there are different levels of university research one, research two, Hofstra where I'm at, we're what's called an emerging research two university that we have met all the qualifications we just have to apply. Uh, so maybe could you talk a little bit about that, Zachary? Okay, you know, I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> well, so uh, the, the appointment that I have, I, mean, I think that when you're talking about different levels of, of um, professorships, um, some of course would be, there's obviously adjuncts, there's obviously then there's like um, people who are non-tenured who may be full-time, which is myself. And then there are people who are actually on tenure tracks and people who actually, you know, do obtain, obtain tenure. So those are the different levels of, uh, of actual um, positions, so to speak, ranks, so to speak, in the university. And so obviously the higher up you go, you tend, you tend to require more uh, credentials. Like for example, uh, for the position that I have, I don't remember if my, um, degree because I have two master's degrees one in journalism and one in, in English um, I, don't, I don't remember how the, what the qualifications were because I do know that the, the professor of practice job is one that tends to be one that's more like a hands-on one where it's almost um, a, a lot of, a lot uh, um, uh, comes from your experience in the field uh, that said there are other people who are in the university who are uh, assistant professors and who are you know on, on the track to become um, more um, full professors, they require PhDs. So um, it's it it kind of does vary in terms of the appointment that you're searching for. But getting yourself into the door, from what I remember at Stony Brook, just becoming an adjunct is is not something that requires a an advanced degree. Um, uh, it helps. It, I think it does help in terms of credentials and in terms of any competition you might have. But for the most part, um, just getting into the door, it does not require that. Getting a full-time position, though, um, the credentials uh, increase in in um, in stature, so to speak. So mine, I think, does not. I mean, I think it. it I just don't remember what mine requires because um, it's been a while now since I applied. But the other ones, and obviously, there are several people who are full-time tenure professors and those require PhDs for the most part. Yeah, and at Hofstra where I am, uh, because we're not a research one university, it's not an absolute requirement that you have a PhD in the School of Communication because the highest terminal degree is a master's degree at our, in, in our school. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the degree requirement to become uh, a full-time assistant tenure track professor is master's degree. Uh, so just so folks understand there are different requirements. Uh, you have to look at the university, depends on the university. Every university is a little bit different, but you know, a very large university um, like uh, Stony Brook, where it's a research university, generally speaking, the requirement beyond professor of practice is is to have that PhD. Uh -huh. um, okay, uh, let's see. And uh, let me go to this question. So let me go to a, a more fun question. Um, like what, what's your life like as a professor? And I asked this question 
Well, I'll tell you why I asked this question afterward. And I'll let you give your answers first and then I'll throw in my two cents. Uh, why don't we start with Lisa? What are, what are, what's life like for you as a professor? So I'm not sure exactly what question you're hoping I'll answer, but let's put it this way. I, the hard part is the grading um, because I'm assigning my students articles. And so it's depending upon how large my class is, it can be pretty brutal um, having to line edit um, and instruct. And I make them re, I always make them resubmit articles because what's the point of me doing all that editing if they're just going to throw it in their backpack, right? So they're, they are always required to do two versions of every article. Um, so I would say that that's the hard part because it, because that's hard to fit into my freelance schedule, right? So, um, but I think the benefits outweigh that minor inconvenience because one of the things I love is that I get to mentor the next generation of journalists. And I know that sounds very highfalutin, but it's really important to me um, that, you know, my mom's side comes out often with my students. Um, I've found that in the last, since the pandemic, they're incredibly fragile. Um, I'm, it's just been really hard on our students. Um, so I find myself not just teaching them professional skills, I'm teaching them emotional <laughs> and uh, just light skills, right? But I also just love the fact that um, so many of my students have become colleagues. I just got a call from one yesterday who wanted to know if I was interested in a really fun freelance job. And that makes me feel good because it means that I was able to help prepare them for their career so that they're in a position where they can say, hey, <laughs> would you like to do something for me? Um, so that's just some of the, the benefits. Um, there's lots of other stuff too, but I'll let other people have a chance to speak. And I'm not sure that that's what you're hoping I would get at. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have any particular thought in mind. Um, so Holly, uh, what's life like for you as a professor and particularly as the chair of your department? Well, there's a lot of, um, you know, as she just mentioned, there's a lot of, it's not just you teach and you go. Like, for example, you know, I thought I was gonna go in and, you know, if you're at News 12 and the, and the show is at five and you're the first story at five and you don't get your package in at five, you've really messed up you know you've you missed your slot your package didn't air you're not gonna last long at 12 so I was just like all right here we go I'm gonna have due dates and I'm gonna have do whatever and and I thought okay I'm not gonna have a, like okay if it's 501 at news 12 you're also done because it was supposed to already start you know so I'm like I'm not gonna be that strict but I'm I'm gonna hold all these people to these due dates and stuff and then I realized like half of them are just not gonna pass the class if I do that so I'm you know, the, the life of a teacher is not just like, oh, I'm grading, which does take a lot of time because I do get very detailed in my grading. Um, it's also, you know, a bit of handholding. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we had one student who, who took care of a family member during the day. So there were times where she really couldn't do the work. So there's a lot of like juggling and life skills and how can we get this done around your other schedule? And some of them work, some of them don't. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with individual classes that I take. And now that I'm the chair, I teach fewer classes. I still, I still teach three a semester. And then I'm sort of watching the other professors, uh, the other adjuncts and, and trying to get them on board, um, helping people with classroom management, which really isn't something that I ever, you know, classroom management is something that we've learned on the fly, at least myself and a bunch of other people that we work together. We're not long, we're not long time professors. Um, you know, I came in 2016. Uh, one of my main professors came shortly after that. A couple of people, a couple of people predate me. They've been there for a while, but um, there's a lot of classroom management, a lot of like every problem is kind of mine right now as chair, which I don't particularly like. I kind of want to be like, you know, when, when I'm reporting, it's whether I'm, if I'm at wins, it's me in my car doing what I need to do, getting it done. And now there's all sorts of other people that I'm either trying to help the, the professors or I'm trying to help the students navigate. So there's just a lot more moving parts than I'm used to. Um, but it is so enjoyable, like, you know, like you just said, when, when you have a student that has now graduated and gone on to something in the career and there, there are a couple of my students that are just really starting to 
um, get into their careers, which is amazing. Um, we do have, we've had students the last few years we've applied to the PCLI awards. And so each year we've had, a, you know, at least a couple of students come and, and be honored for their work. And I'm just so proud of them. And I, I can't believe like, I'm so proud of seeing them there getting this. It's better than even when I ever won something in the past from the PCLI. It's just like, wow, these are my students that they're doing it. Um, again, I'm not sure if I answered your question either, but I hopefully, hopefully mm -hmm. that was it. <laughs> <laughs> no, good, good, good. No problem. Uh, and Zachary, what's life like for you as a professor uh, at Stony Brook? You know, I have to echo what both of you um, have said. I mean, it is a very um, rewarding, um, emotionally uh, enriching kind of uh, feeling to be a, a professor when you have students who, who succeed. And I look at, look at the job as kind of being, in some respects, kind of a, a guide and a cheerleader for the profession uh, of journalism. I get them, try to get them excited about it because I really enjoyed my career, um, getting to do all the things that I did, meeting the people that I that I met, um, on going certain places and covering, um, uh, you know, very very current and critical issues. So um, for me, it's uh, in some respects I find myself as an ambassador for the uh, the the field that we love so much, and so I'm excited about to to impart to them. Uh, what I've done and what I um, uh, see in terms of changes in the field, norms in the field, different practices that I think that they should adopt in order to succeed in the field. And it is a thrilling um, uh, feeling to, to see um, them rewarded in the form of like when their work gets, gets printed or it gets broadcast, et cetera, and to see the satisfaction that they have. So I certainly get a live vicariously through their, um, through their successes. As far as um, sort of a daily routine, I think um, you know, I tend to have two classes mostly uh, a, a day. Um, most of my week is most most of my weeks are like that. Two, two classes a day, depending on, on the semester. And so um, it, it is um, a, a more relaxed schedule certainly than it was when I was a journalist. There's a lot of running around as a journalist, uh, covering breaking news, for example, or even doing something that's more enterprise oriented. It'll be a lot more time spent um, alone. Uh, doing reporting, running around. So this is a, a, a drastically different uh, lifestyle, so to speak, because a, a good chunk of it is certainly preparing. There is a good chunk of grading, no doubt about that. One of the challenges I find is that grading, it's hard to sustain the kind of perseverance that you would have like, the first student you start off with. You, you, know, you really dig into that person's paper and you give them all the critiques and then you got 20 more papers to go. <laughs> so it's hard to sustain that, you know, that level of energy. And I think that's one of the challenges of a professor. Then, you know, that's just one class. You got to do another class and another class. So timing and sort of like pacing out the the, how the assignments are, um, are configured when they're due. And of course, you know, uh, Lisa was talking about different drafts and, and et cetera. That's true too. You want to have them submit uh, at least another draft, maybe two drafts more to give them a chance to, to, to take advantage of the feedback that you give. So, right. but I find that, oh, I saw you. Yeah. Keep going. I find that, I find that very, very um, different than the way things worked um, in, in, in the profession. So, um, but, I, but again, qu quite a, a, a thrilling uh, kind of job nonetheless. And, and I think as a mentor to them, because I mean, students come in with, with a bunch of issues and problems and the like that are real life issues. Um, so for example, um, uh, students who have you know, a, lot, a lot of obligations outside of their assignments, students who are so-called so non-traditional students who may be older, who may have families to take care of and the like, those are, are, they have a separate set of challenges for them as well. And you have to have that compassion and um, concern for them um, because they have uh, a bunch of other requirements that weigh on their ability to get those assignments done. And of course, we like to take a hard and fast and really sort of, um, um, particular view of the way deadlines uh, function in the profession. And I find that sometimes I have to be a little more flexible with students. So there's a little bit of relaxation of those things and, and I'm constantly telling them that you may be, you may be a great writer because you may have written papers and English classes and social, social studies and the like in history. And we're not saying that these, this writing is wrong, so to speak. It's just 
it doesn't conform to the way the industry uh, wants your copy to look. And so they feel a lot more relaxed when they learn that, that they're not doing it wrong. They're just doing it differently than the way the industry um, norms have evolved. And I try to get in, go into how the norms have evolved, some historical events, technology, the Civil War, a whole bunch of things have, have been, have created the conventions in journalism. And I, I like imparting that kind of information to them. And I think they get excited about the field more when they have that context. Yeah, and can everybody talk a little bit about the workload that's involved with being a professor? And I, you've alluded, you've all to one degree or another alluded to that, but can you talk a little bit more specifically about that? Uh, now, I asked that question in part because when I left the Herald as executive editor, I know that a few people <laughs> asked me, how does it feel to be retired? And I said, I'm not retired. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. teach full time. Uh, and they would say something like, well, yeah, you're going to be a professor, you know, with the implication, of course, that it's something of a pushy job, um, which it's anything but, as all of you know. So can you, and I, I do think that there is to one degree or another that perception out there. So can each of you talk a little bit about the workload more specifically in part, so that way folks don't come, up, come away with the view that, you know, this is a, a light and easy job, which it is anything but. Uh, I would say that it's certainly less stressful, as Zachary had said, than being a full-time reporter. A lot less stressful, um, but it's definitely not a, a light load. Anybody want to jump in there? Well, I want to jump in because I wanted to say, in a, here's something unexpected about the job. Um, and that is what I alluded to before about my students, many of them being fragile. I didn't expect that I would need to learn about public safety and the counseling department, that I would have to talk to a student who was considering suicide as I was driving to class. Um, I did not anticipate having to deal with, with real life issues of students, right? And I felt ill prepared to do that. Um, it was, especially right after the pandemic, it was exhausting emotionally for me. And so I want people to understand that you're dealing with young lives. You're dealing with people like Zach and Holly both alluded to that have other things going on, right? And we definitely oriented people need to adapt to that. Um, and, and that becomes an unexpected part of the workload. Regarding the actual work, um, you know, I've been teaching the same classes for a number of years, although I'm about to teach a class that I've never taught before. And so it's going to double up my work. Um, so I think that, you know, planning for classes, making sure it doesn't matter that I've had the same syllabus for a while. I'm constantly changing it, constantly adapting to what's going on in the media world and the, and the world beyond that. So um, you can never phone it in. <laughs> it's like constantly changing. Um, my husband's been an English teacher in high school for 27 years, and he, I always think, how does he do that year after year, five times a day? But he, he says the same thing that I learned, too, that every class is different. The energy of every class is different. Every semester, every, it's just always different. Um, and you need to flow with that. So I think that's something that's really important. It's not just about grading, although that's, that's very important. I mean, um, editing and 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 teaching. Um, it's about standing up there and, you know, when the kids are on their cell phones trying to get them to pay attention to you, I always say to them, you know, I can see you, right? <laughs> um, you know, so sometimes I, I feel like they think they're hiding and I'm like, well, no. I know that your, your crotch area is not that exciting. I would never <laughs> say that in the class, but like, I see everybody looking at a video play against someone like that. It's like, they don't right. know that I see you. Right. So those are things that we as journalists, like we just do our thing, right? We're in a lot of times we're in a silo to make our deadlines. And so I think that's important for anyone who's considering this, just to realize that there's another side to it. You're dealing with human beings, not deadlines. And you're dealing with young human beings who have so many things going on in their lives that many of us can't even um, imagine. And you're going to have to deal with that. They're all in a state of flux. They're all... Yeah figuring their lives out. Yeah. Uh, Zach and Holly, how about you? What uh, what about the workload? How do you, either one of you find it? I think it's a lot, a lot more work than as a reporter, other than the times that I did like 
a special, you know, if I was working on like a half hour show or something like that, where I would take my work home with me and work on it at home and stuff like that. But like the grading does take a lot of time. I've gotten more efficient as it's gone along. Um, and she just mentioned like, once you've taught a class at least once, you, you're constantly updating it, but at least I have an idea of how the class is going to go. Like I taught an ethics class the first time was 2016, it was primary season, you know, and I taught it for a few years. So every year, like everything I showed in the class was different because we were talking about why did someone cover it this way? Why did someone cover it this way? Did, this, did these people leave it out? Did, did they, should they have done this? So there's always something new to talk about. Um, there's just, a, there's a lot of, you know, grading does take a long time. Um, I, I don't know, I don't want to discourage anyone, but like adjuncts don't make a ton of money. And if you, once you average it out to all the hours that you're grading, it's probably like 25 cents an hour, <laughs> maybe a little bit more than that, but we have smaller classes. So that does, <laughs> that does help. I, I've only had like, I've had a class of 20, a couple of times, 22, but some of my classes are 10, 12, 16, something like that. So I've never had like a giant, giant class. Um, it does, it does take a lot of time, but especially the first time you're doing it because you really are starting, you know, the syllabus may already exist, but you're kind of starting from scratch on what you're doing with that syllabus. And when I first came, we ended up creating a lot of classes because we're a very hands-on school and previously we had no TV studio. So now, you know, you're not just reading about doing, you know, TV broadcasts, you're doing TV broadcasts. So it took a little while to create a few classes and really get them started. Um, we also have, I should mention too, that we're more of like a mass communication school. So journalism is a big part of that. And obviously journalism is my background. So I come at everything from a journalism angle, but I've also had to learn over the years that many of our students are not gonna go into journalism, but they're gonna go into other things. And, and sports broadcasting, I consider sports journalism as well. But you know, uh, many of our students are gonna go into production studios and work on you know editing and shooting not news pieces, but maybe commercials or, um, you know, someone who works for, you know, a, a nonprofit doing, I always tell them, you know, you, these skills will transfer if you're maybe working for a, an, an animal shelter and you need to put out a video of like, come adopt Fido. These are the skills you're still going to need. If you can do news, you can do anything, but it, it, I don't want to, like, I kind of feel like you could, but <laughs> it, it's, everything's a little different, but if you have the basics of, you know, strong writing, strong technical abilities, you can bring it to different things, but the students who are really not interested in news, I've had to find other ways to do things, like we started a cooking segment, you know, we try to do more featurey things, and then, you know, one student was doing a student profile and like he was doing a report on a student that was student athlete, you know, who started in another college, transferred to five towns and did really well in five towns. And he's like, oh, I'd much rather do this than journalism. And I thought, do I tell him? Yeah. I paused for a minute and I said, just so you know, this is journalism because you're telling a story, you're giving facts, you're doing interviews. This is journalism too. So sometimes it's a little bit, you know, of a push to get students interested in what they're interested in and then finding what they like and trying to get that as part of their achievements in your class. Very nice. Uh, so let me, because uh, we're just at about 742 and I just want to quickly wrap up the question, my questioning part of it, uh, with a quick question to end on a positive note. What's your favorite lesson? So Zach. What's, what's your favorite lesson that you teach? It just has to be one lesson. I teach a lesson on diversity, which I like doing a lot. Um, it, um, it's, and it shows how the value of um, how newsrooms have to be more diverse um, uh, in order to uh, properly reflect the societies where these pub where the publications or the or the, uh, the television station, whatever it is, whatever media outlet it is, I have a pretty detailed uh, presentation that I like to give uh, to students on that. Um, that's one. It's that it's like five or six, but that's one that I like a lot. Another one that I like to do on ethics as well. So that's probably my my favorite one, though. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, how about you? What's your favorite lesson? Specific lesson, but I what I love about what I do is that I bring hands-on experience to every class. I'm constantly, my focus is preparing them for their future careers. Not all of them are going to go into journalism, but they will go into some communications related field. And so I bring to them 
problems that I may have had, like having to uh, reschedule a video and photo shoot this morning, because who knew if it was going to be smoky, you know, if we're going to be able to do. So like, I like to bring them what I'm working on, how I solve the problem, and just so that they know that, you know, that, that they can do it too. And I would, one last thing I just want to add is that um, I think that being a professor has made me a better journal, better journalist. Sure. It has made me yeah. aware of, um, first of all, a different generation that I'm experiencing, but also real life situations. I learned the hard way about preferred pronouns, and that's not even the way it, preferred pronouns isn't even the right phrase. I learned the hard way about making sure that I am taking care of what my students need, right? And I don't think I would have paid as much attention as a journalist, if not for them. And so I really do think that being in the classroom and working directly with young adults who are hoping to pursue a career in our fields has made me better at what I do. And Holly, how about your favorite lesson? I haven't taught this class in a while, but I was teaching um, news, re news reporting and writing, um, broadcast news reporting and writing. And there was one lesson in which you talk about how you can find information online. And it's funny because you think all the kids are digital natives and all the students are digital natives and they know way more than we do about social media and stuff. And they don't really, they know how to use it to contact their friends, but they don't really know how to use the computer or social media as much. And in this lesson, it goes on like how to look up you know, whitepages.com. And so <laughs> I, I tell them, let's at whitepages.com, anywho, whatever. So we start with that. And then I look around and I see people's jaws drop open as they see their name and their address. I'm like, anyone can look at this? And I was like, yes. And like their, their mouths are literally open, like flies can fly in. And then we go into, you know, how you can look up, you know, statistics on something, you know, through government websites, through data.gov, through, um, you know, parents from Megan's Law, you can find out sex offenders in your in your neighborhood. And they're just open their eyes to all that. It's just, it, that was my favorite lesson, but I haven't taught that class in a couple of years. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to go now to the question and answer period, uh, portion of our program. Uh, and if you have a question, just, you know, raise your little electronic hand uh, or feel free to raise your regular hand, but most of you can, don't have your, Cameras on, so just raise your virtual hand. Uh, and let's start with James Medore. You have your hand up. Lisa Thank you. Question. Thank you to all of you for doing this. Um, I'm wondering how one gets started. You know, just because you're a good journalist doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be any good in the classroom. So I'm wondering, is it the way to start? You know, seeing if you can be an adjunct someplace, seeing if you can team teach with someone who's a professional teacher. How does one begin? Um, who would like well, to take that question? I'll try. I mean, I I think um, James one one way. I mean, I think it was mentioned earlier. I think maybe Scott mentioned it that you know if you um, have an inkling for it, maybe you come to a class um, and actually teach one. You know, as you're a guest speaker in a class, and if you kind of like that, was it was it Scott who said that, or was it Lisa? Or was Holly? Well, anyway, somebody else said it before me. I'm not, this is not an original thought. Um, yes, but that I think is a nice little training ground to see whether or not you'd like, you know, you could get your feet wet by just, um, you know, being a guest speaker in a class to see how, you know, what it takes to prepare for your, your lesson, um, whether or not you like the, you know, the interaction with the students. Um, just, it's a way to, you know, cost-free way to sort of go in and see what it's like. I would say that. And then of course, beyond that, of course, um, becoming an adjunct, uh, a course that you know a lot about. Um, so maybe an introductory uh, course will, will be most most of your speed. But I think, you know, really trying it out by simply visiting a class. And also you can, you know, ask a professor uh, if you can sit in on a class to see, you know, what it's like to be in the, in the classroom, whether or not you want to be up there and, you know, having students to in entertain for, you know, hour and 20 minutes because, you know, the classes can be long. Um, so I, and I'd say that's probably, those are two or three different ways to try to get in to see whether or not you even like it at all. Hey, James, what are you doing on Tuesdays this fall? <laughs> right, I'd love yeah. for you to come to my class. <laughs> so let's definitely come, to keep in touch. The other thing I wanted to add to what Zach was saying is that 
there, I know at Adelphi, often they are specifically looking for an adjunct. They, at one point, um, they were looking for a sports journalist, a sports journalism professional to teach a class. So keep on the lookout for that too, that there may be, sometimes the universities are looking for somebody specific because full-time staff's workload is too big or somebody's on a sabbatical. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you. Yeah, the other thing that I would add to that is to, to do a little studying on how to be a teacher yourself before you actually start. Uh, I, would go to, I would go to a university library, find a few education textbooks, and just read a, one or two of them. Uh, they don't even have to be textbooks. There are a lot of excellent just, you know, kind of hands-on how to be a college professor books out there uh, written by college professors. Um, and I say that in part because the, the teaching techniques are very important for engaging students. I mean, I have a master's in education, uh, so it, it came a lot easier to me than a number of adjuncts uh, when I first started back in 2009, uh, because I had that background in the kind of the, the classroom techniques uh, that you need to, to be a successful professor. Um, it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Lots of people want to be a columnist, right? Um, but and when you ask them to write more than one column, they don't really can't really come up with much. And it's the same deal with being a professor. You know, a lot of people want to be professors, but once they get past the first lesson, uh, it's hard to get on to lesson two, three, four, five, unless you have you know some background in the techniques. Uh, the other thing is that if you want to take it even a step further, is to go to a college and and just take a class or two in education. I think that would be helpful. Um, okay, uh, let's go to Chrissy Sampson. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this to uh, PCLI. Hi, Zach. How's it going? Hey, Chrissy. How um, are you? <laughs> I'm good. I, I want to know, um, how do you, how do you, give me some resume tips. Like, how do I sell myself for that college role that, um, you know, I don't have a master's degree. I have 22 years of experience. I'm an editor now, like, where where am I you know where am I going wrong that you know I'm making inquiries but not even getting a reply? I think in in our in our case I, I think um, again looking for listings that are in your you know your 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 particular part of journalism um, and then. I thought it was interesting because a lot of people are asking for CVs and all your, like our place asked for transcript from, from college. And I was like, I don't, I don't even know if they do that, but they still send them like, you can do that. Um, I would just say, you can obviously tailor your resume anytime you send it out in your cover letter to say, hey, I've got you know 22 years experience doing X, Y, Z. You know, there's never any harm in calling a department chair if you can get through and just um, doing what we recommend to our students, schedule an informational interview, right? Don't we tell our kids to do that? Like if you're interested in working for someone, ask if you can have an informational interview with them, go for it. <laughs> I would agree with that. And you can also, um, you can join, an, there are associations. So the Association for Journal uh, Education and Journalism and Mass Communication. Yes. I would definitely recommend joining that organization because then you're gonna hear about trends. You'll also start to learn the language of being a professor, because there is this whole other, I think Holly sort of alluded to that, there's this whole other language here that you have to learn um, that is not like journalism. So when you go for that informational interview and you can speak the language of higher education, that's very helpful. Uh, so I would join an association, and there are many, but the main one is, Association for Education, Journalism, and Mass Education, uh, Mass Communication. And they also have job listings there as yes, well. Yes, <laughs> job listings, definitely. Lots of them, no doubt about uh, it. Yeah. yeah, tons of job listings. You get a regular weekly newsletter or a monthly newsletter. So yeah, definitely. Um, I didn't know about that. I'm gonna check that out, thank you. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> that was extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, let's see, Ethan Hart. Hello. Hi, thanks everyone for joining this um, question for you. 35 years in the business, TV, radio, network, local, big places, small places. Also a college dropout. Am I out of luck as far as any kind of 
adjunct or regular teaching. I've done a little guest lecturing, but that's about it. Again, I think that I, I personally would say, I mean, uh, others can jump in. I would say it depends again on the college and what they're looking for, um, you know, and what their, their specific requirements are. I can tell you that Bob Green taught at both, but he was two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, you know, former investigative journalist at uh, Newsday, I believe he would started the, the investigative news pro, uh, department there. Zach could tell, tell us better about that. But um, he didn't have a college degree. Uh, and yet he taught at both Stony Brook and Hofstra. Um, now, of course, it doesn't hurt to have two Pulitzers uh, but, uh, and, and his national name, but, but he did not have a college degree. So it's not an absolute requirement, although these days it's more of a requirement than it was 30 years ago. Yeah, it's definitely well stated. Yes, I think um, um, in some respects, journalism programs have struggled uh, inside of universities because of the lack of so-called so rigor that the other departments have. So I think the, there is more of a premium on getting a higher degree now um, as the departments become a lot more academic uh, feeling, so to speak. Um, but yeah, in the past, certainly no degree, just a high school you know, diploma at best was required for people like Bob Green and others who are pretty prominent in the field. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, before we started, there was a course that I teach in which I, I, I we profile several amazing journalists um, throughout history and many of them had no degrees. They were just, you know, really the fantastic uh, journalist, um, dogged determination and just pure grit and intellect, but no degrees. So and Ethan and James, I was I was just thinking back to how I started, right, where I was just offering adult ed classes in um, my local high school and library. That might be a way for you not only to get experience um, in front of the classroom, but also to add to your resume. Um, you know, every single school district has continuing ed programs. Um, maybe you can come up with a class that you can offer, or you can um, see if they have any openings in classes they'd like to offer, right? I think that's an excellent suggestion because yeah. most colleges want to see a combination of lots of field experience and at least some teaching experience, you know, even if it's, you know, a couple of years teaching a continuing education class. Um, they do want to see just a few years or even a few semesters of some teaching experience, uh, because that'll give them a sense of, can this person actually, you know, teach more than one class? Uh, one, you know, so yeah. We've uh, had a couple people here and there that did not have a bachelor's and as long as they, I mean, they had like 20, 25, 30 years experience, which, you know, um, I think they weren't really considered for multiple uh, adjunct assignments, but they got their foot in the door and got to teach a couple classes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it also say that, you know, now it's so easy to get something online that maybe, you know, someone could finish up. Um, I know someone who also initially when they were working as a journalist and they didn't have a degree um, and then they went just right and got a master's. They like somehow convinced the college like, hey, I, like the college course was like, you will produce a TV package. And the guy's like, I, I do this every day. Uh, um, yeah, it's not gonna take me one semester to do this. So they, so he convinced them to, uh, to use some of the experience. And then he took his master's and just skipped over a bachelor's. So I don't know if that's of an interest either. I was also just gonna add, you know, um, I'm an introvert and I never dreamed I'd be standing in front of a classroom year after year, but I discovered by doing those, again, those adult ed classes that I feed off the energy of people who are responding to the things that I'm saying, um, to, to the shared experience that we have when we're going back and forth about something that's going on in the news or debating how to approach a topic. Um, and so in, unless you do that, you'll never know if you'll even like standing in front of a classroom or discover something about yourself that you didn't know. And the only last thing I would say about like selling yourself to universities and branding yourself to universities, it's a good idea to have your own website. Um, I know, Lisa has one, I have one, uh, so, you know, a lot of college professors have their own website in part because now the emphasis is on convergence journalism, on interactive media, uh, and there's no better way to prove that and show that than your own website that you manage. 
um, no matter how you create it, um, so long as you've created it, um, because that's that's a skill set that they, you know, at least I can't speak for every university, but I believe among the four universities that are represented here, that that's definitely the case. The emphasis is on, you know, the multimedia skills uh, that were not a requirement when Bob Green was teaching 30 years ago. Uh, okay, any other questions? Just looking through to see here. No. I wanted to add something that unexpectedly happened in my career is that because of my classroom experience, I actually have been uh, doing a lot of freelance writing for universities now because mm -hmm. I speak their language. Um, and that, again, I never set out to do that, but I love it. Um, and they actually pay better than newspapers. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, okay, great. Scott, Any, Scott yeah. can I just mention, there is a question in the chat. How do you move from an adjunct professor to a full-time position? Oh, oh, well, I can tell you it's a, it's a, that's a good question. Um, well, I can speak. It normally takes a while, right? Yeah, <laughs> but I'll start with Holly and Zach, because both of you also made that leap. Uh, Holly, you want to start? <laughs> okay. So in our case, we were a grow we were a growing department. So um we ended up with, you know, just my boss was there initially. We were part of the liberal arts division, then we split off to our own division. And then as more people came in, we needed an we needed another person in there full time. And then when my boss advanced, then I took his position and then we hired one of our adjuncts this past summer, then she became full time. So it just sort of happened like that. But I mean, we're such a small school that that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, that's similar. I think um, that, I think that does happen. I think that's pretty common where it winds up that there's adjuncts are there and they're sort of like uh, uh, already a uh, resource, so to speak, for when a position does become available. They're among the first to hear about it. And then, of course, they have a proven track record from having done some work as an adjunct. And I think that's what happened with, with me. I'd been at, at um, Stony Brook for quite some time, 2003 to 2020, so, you know, quite some time of um, taking on different courses, summer as well. And of course, the, you know, we mentioned the high school program that I also worked on as well. So I was sort of a long time presence there uh, and a position came open and uh, I sort of applied for it and I was you know accepted for it. So just being in the right place at the right time, so to speak, or having some longevity there was, I think was the key for me at least. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think longevity as an adjunct uh, plays a big factor. Um, it can play a big factor. I mean, I was pretty lucky in that when I was applying for my full-time position, there were actually two positions open. So Hofstra requires a national search um, and it's a, month long, it's a months long search. Um, and they're usually 100 to 150 candidates who are applying for the position somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so the competition is, is pretty stiff. Uh, so like I said, I felt pretty lucky that there were two positions open at that time. Um, and I think again, because of my longevity, I've been there since 2009, which is a pretty long time, um, 13 years um that 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 was my entree into to becoming a full-time professor i should also note that you know it also depends on, on your university so Hofstra university uh, i'm on the tenure track being on the tenure track is definitely um i don't know it is intense let's put it that way uh because there's a there's a threefold requirement to becoming a tenure professor one is you have to demonstrate teaching excellence Two, you have to demonstrate service to the university. So you have to serve on a lot of committees, which I do. Um, and then you, the third part of it is you have to conduct research. So I, right now I'm involved in three research projects in addition to doing journalism, which I do uh, with a partnership that we have with WABC Eyewitness News. We're doing a lot of work with our Long Island Advocate and WABC News. So there's a lot of requirements once you become a tenure professor. Uh, a tenure track professor. And then it's a, it's a fairly lengthy period to become an actual tenure track professor. So I'm it, at Hofstra, it's six years. And I have, because they gave me credit for teaching experience uh, as a full-time special assistant, um, I have three years remaining on the tenure track before I become a tenured professor. So it's it's a pretty lengthy process and it can be a very lengthy process. And getting 
to full-time professor can be, it's very competitive, let's put it that way. Okay, any other questions? I also actually wanna point out too that, um, you know, sometimes it does take an adjustment for, you know, people who are, who are deadline driven, we get it done, we get it done. And then you're in a class and many of the students are not like that. So you're, it's a little bit of like, oh, now what do I do? So, I mean, being an adjunct, you, you kind of, it's not for everyone, not everyone loves it. Um, and, and also understanding like, okay, so out of the students that I have, some of them are really, they're ready to go. Some of them are not here. So I always try to think, okay, how can I bring them all up in some way? Um, I was never the student who'd like missed an assignment, you know, or, or a professional, like we all made our deadlines because that's, we wouldn't be in this business for, for very long if we didn't. So you're, you're coming in with, with a varying, at least in our school, we have varying skill levels and varying levels of people getting things done. And sometimes it's a little hard to understand coming from someone who like always got it done. Why are they not getting it done? So there's a little bit of, um, I don't want to say culture shock, but like there's a little bit of understanding again that goes into that whole situation where I don't want to paint roses like everyone's coming in and they're writing like an amazing piece the first day that they're there or even turning in all the work. Um, but then when you see students go from like, I don't know what this is, you know, they've never held a camera, they've never edited something, they've never written a sentence other than like a term paper to, um, wow, they're up for a PCLI award. Like it's, it's super rewarding in that way. And thank you, by the way, for having me here. I never did that. thank everyone for that at the very beginning. Uh, well, we have one last question here that uh, Cecilia Dowd put into the uh, chat. If everybody's willing to give just a few extra minutes here, uh, what would be your proudest moment as a professor? For me, it's when students who came in in the fall or the, the beginning of the semester thinking that they couldn't write work their butts off and get something published um, professionally. You know, I guide them as far as I can. And that's, it's just so exciting. I feel like, I feel like their mom, like, yay. <laughs> um, and then of course, when um, I've been fortunate for many, for over a dozen years to sit at the PCLIs with my students and see them get awards and scholarships. And it's, it's very, it's what it's all about. You're in the classroom to, again, to mentor the next generation of journalists. And I want to mentor our competition, right? <laughs> nice. Uh, Zach, how about you? What's your proudest? Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, several students, you know, are now at, at, at um, pretty large publications, um, you know, doing great work and I'm seeing their bylines all over the place. Those, I mean, the fact that I, you know, was there in the beginning and some since high school, literally, you know, because of the green program, um, just seeing people go so far um, and knowing that I played a small role in that, that's that my proudest moment. So I get, I get that moment happening quite often now because so many, I have so much time in the field now as a professor that more students are graduating and going on to great, uh, great careers. So um, it's hard to pinpoint any one moment because it's happening all the time now. So, but that particular, you know, um, uh, when I get news like that, that's when I can always bask in that glory for a little bit. Nice. Holly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here. When I see, you know, when I see the students next, you know, next week getting a PCLI award, just even mm -hmm. being up there um, and also getting jobs, you know, I have starting now to have students with jobs and seeing them turn packages and mm -hmm. it's just, it's amazing to me. And one of my students says she does, she does some packages and she's like, I always have you in my ear <laughs> saying, <laughs> Don't forget this or don't forget that. And I just thought that was so sweet. Well, and the fun part is following your students through many years. Uh, so since I've been teaching since 2009, I have students who are now in their 30s, some of whom my student, former students got married to each other and now have kids together, which is weird, um, but fun. Um, and yes, seeing them get jobs. And for me, like uh, I, as a, at Hofstra, only full-time professors attend graduation. So I didn't attend my first graduation until last year, but seeing how happy the students are on graduation day is just really something special because they, they're just so elated and so happy. And honestly, that makes it all worth it for me. Yeah, and like Holly said, I love it when I hear from students who say, I always have in the back of my mind exactly what you told me to do. And you were right. <laughs> yeah. That's always gratifying, right? Uh -huh. 
Okay, great. Um, excellent. Uh, I think we're about wrapping up. I'm going to throw it back to Brendan. Thank again. Thank you everybody for attending, and thank you to our three panelists. You've all been fantastic. Brendan, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you, Scott, uh, for moderating tonight's event. This was wonderful. Zachary, Lisa, Holly, uh, thank you so much for being here. We're already getting amazing feedback about what a great job you all did and how valuable this has been. And those awards you keep hearing people mention, if you miss it at the top of the event, the PCLI Media Awards Ceremony and Hall of Fame induction is next week, Thursday, June 15th at 6 p.m. at Fox Hollow in Woodbury. It's going to be a great night. You don't need to be a finalist to attend the ceremony. If you just want to be there to witness the Hall of Fame induction or to witness the awards be handed out for all of the great student and professional journalists from all ends of Long Island across print, broadcast, podcasting, digital media, you name it. Join us at Fox Hollow on Thursday, June 15th. If you are interested in entering, our awards entry period starts in January, and we accept entries until the middle of March, maybe a little bit later. And you could find out all the information about our awards or how to buy tickets to next week's event at pcli.org. You could also find Press Club of Long Island on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on LinkedIn. Thank you once again to our audience. We can't have these events without an audience. We're very grateful that you joined us. If you would like to replay this immediately or share it, this was streaming on Facebook and you could share it from there. Or if you give us a little while, we will upload an edited version to YouTube and we will also archive this event on PCLI.org. 